the next program you'll be hearing is the I California so, Connection Part 2. Playwright and author Donald Freed uh, continues with Professor Richard Popkin to detail the conspiratorial link between the assassinations of the Kennedys, Martin Luther King, and the attempted murder of George Wallace. Uh, new information is revealed concerning the true cause for the Watergate break-in. Before we start that program, we'd like to ask you to help support KPFA's Watergate coverage, which will be continuing in September when the Senate Watergate hearings resume. Here now is the California Connection, Part 2. The Watergate break-in was nothing but a dramatic incident that was a convenient rallying point for the media. The tip of the iceberg began with the Watergate break-in. The iceberg itself has to be seen as a vast and monolithic superstructure. I'm talking now only about the tip of the iceberg. Operation Gemstone has to be described in the terminology and diagram of a clandestine intelligence operation, exactly as one would describe a coup de main, a stealthy attempt from within the government to take power, and not electoral power, not simply four more years, but the kind of power which no democracy with its checks and balances allows. Now, the superstructure that I've abstracted on this chart, and indeed on all of them, is organized crime, corrupt unions, big business, a kind of a label, especially for the multinational uh, organizations, and intelligence fronts. The intelligence front in Operation Gemstone is the committee to re-elect the president. Nixon and Mitchell, Nixon is of course the representative in every way of these forces and has been so since he first answered a classified ad to run for Congress <laughs> those many years ago. One of the sponsors of that ad is about to be indicted. He's from San Diego, and Dr. Popkin will talk about him. Mitchell played the role of internal security, the president's agent, that is to say, who m was responsible for monitoring uh, what came in and what flowed out of the White House. The East Coast is represented here by Charles Colson. He would be the equivalent of a station chief in the way that in a foreign country a diplomat is a diplom represents the United States interests, but the Central Intelligence Agency will work out of the American Embassy in a foreign country, and from there the clandestine, the training of police, the various propaganda operations uh, will go forward. And of course these activities center around usually elections in these countries, as in Chile, for example. Colson would be the equivalent then of the station chief, the man in charge of plans. And it's as if, of course, that we were simply natives and or colonized subjects and a group of settlers or neo-colonialists were organizing in a clandestine manner from within the country and from within the government to set a to, to, take, to set in motion the equivalent American style of a military push or a coup de main. But it would be from within the government, from within power itself, in the same way that the Reichstag incident was staged after Hitler was chancellor, not before, but after. He was already chancellor. He had the majority of the vote. What he did not have was dictatorial power, and that is why, long after Nixon ran way ahead of McGovern in the polls, it was not stupidity that kept this Operation Gemstone in motion. The winning and the re-election of the presidency was only a minor and first step in Operation Gemstone. Under Colson comes Gordon Liddy, and he would be known in clandestine terms as the executive cutoff. And you can see that it took the most intense pressure to break this compartmentalization down. Liddy, for the longest time, was the beginning and the end of the conspiracy, and so the government argued before Judge Sirica. The compartmentalization held until McCord broke. Under Liddy is Hunt, the field cut off. And under Hunt is McCord, the control or agent handler, the man who runs the contract agents in the field. 
And under McCord on the East Coast, of course, were YAF, Young Americans for Freedom, anti-Castro Cubans, uh, and some other right-wing uh, forces, um, almost all associated with the Central Intelligence Agency, not as employees. None of these people exist in the Central Intelligence Agency files. They are what are called contract agents. They do not exist on paper. On the West Coast, Haldeman is the station chief, and when these charts are revised, Ehrlichman will be in that little box with him. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Haldeman and Ehrlichman are the equivalent of the diplomat uh, at an American mission or at an American embassy, the diplomatic representation of the White House. Colson is the professional, the super conspirator. Haldeman and the others are, shall we say, consummate and brilliant amateurs, but they are amateurs. And although they did everything to finance and forward and cover up Operation Gemstone, they did not think it up. There was plenty of input, as they like to say, in the advertising agencies that spawned men like Haldeman and Ziegler and Dean and others. But this conspiracy it is my argument, and the argument of the Citizens Research and Investigating Committee, is the work of a professional. And the professionals are Colson and Hunt, basically, with McCord as the technician. Haldeman and Ehrlichman then would be the equivalent of ambassadors or diplomats. Chapin would be the executive cutoff for the West Coast wing of Operation Gemstone. So, uh, uh, Chapin and Strawn, rather, the, it would be the field cutoffs. Chapin, the executive cutoff. Strawn, the field cutoff. Donald Segretti, the controller, agent handler, and he would run the agents on the West Coast, the contract agents. Those would have been black, Chicano, Jesus freaks. They were being hired. They were being organized. The final act, the bottom line of Operation Gemstone, were riots in the streets in San Diego, sponsored by Argent Provocateur, and violence through the use of explosives with inside the convention hall. This violence would have been laid at the door of anti-war, liberal, left, radical, McGovern forces. The proof? The proof would have been a variation on the Pentagon Papers theme. Information in the Democratic National Committee headquarters in Washington at Watergate would have been leaked from the files, tying McGovern to these forces. Where would this information have come from? and this is new information tonight, that information was being planted on June 16, 17, 1972, when McCord and the others in evening clothes and rubber gloves were arrested at gunpoint. That Operation Gemstone was aborted, and we saw only vestigial evidence of it when Agnew and others with the Vietnam Veterans Against the War attempted to point out provocation coming from anti-war forces. Of course, it did not materialize, and they knew it would not, and so the use, widespread use of agent provocateurs. When San Diego, because of ITT and other reasons, had to be given up, and the movement was to Miami, where the demonstrations could be controlled more perfectly, then uh, Cubans and Young Americans for Freedom replaced black and Chicano and Jesus freaks, the contract agent provocateurs from the West Coast. Uh, this would, in effect, have canceled the elections. There would have been an election, but you can expect Nixon to have gotten 95 to 99 percent of the vote. Had GOP notables lost their lives in explosions inside the GOP convention and proof been leaked from the DNC that this was tied to McGovern, you know, all intents and purposes the Operation Gemstone would have been in high gear. And from the POW extravaganza, they would have gone directly into the American Revolutionary Bicentennial Program, which was to use tie-in labor unions, students, schools, service groups, churches, armed forces groups, American Legion groups, business, industry, banking, savings and loan. Decals would have been spread across the country, any group or individual without a decal would have been highly visible as being un-American. It would have been made the McCarthy era look like peanuts because instead of identifying un-American elements, it would simply have identified American elements. And that is a fait accompli. And the American bicentennial, which was, not, which has not come until 1976, 
was precisely for that reason begun four years early in 1972. And the, it would have eventuated in parades, in extravaganzas, in torchlight uh, demonstrations. The Leni Riefenstahl films of Hitler Germany in the 30s were being studied by the committee uh, for the American Bicentennial and we could have looked forward to enormous sports stadium uh, spectaculars with lights uh, and flags and excitement, uh, not to say hysteria, that would have been modeled very closely on the spectaculars of the Third Reich in Germany in the 1930s. That was the plan, to go from Gemstone to the POWs to the Bicentennial. But it was aborted, uh, partially, and we now have some small insight. And we must seize this lever, this thin end of the wedge, which the media and other forces have developed, and push as never before. The next chart is the cash flow. Again, organized crime, corrupt unions, big business, intelligence front. The money is washed, as they say in clandestine vocabulary. Uh, part of it goes into the broken line is the washed money. It goes from Stans to Haldeman into Comback. On the West Coast, the primary conduit is Haldeman, the president's personal counsel at uh, Comback, to Segretti, to the field agents. On the East Coast, it's Liddy to Barker, the Cuban, to the field agents. Uh, the money, you can speak forever about it. It goes as deep and as broad as you wish to discuss. That's just a very high-order abstraction of some of the cash flow. It goes up over $10 million for Operation Gemstone, approximating a third of the some $50 million raised for the re-election of the president. Over $10 million and over 100 field agents identified at this point. This is proof positive that we are not contemplating a budget or an itinerary or the recruitment for a break-in of several offices, one in Beverly Hills, one in Washington, several in New York. The break-in the break uh, is, is the, not even the tip of the iceberg. The last chart is the cover-up, and which is still in motion. Uh, through, from the White House itself through Ziegler, missing on there is Viva, of course, and the POW, which has to be prominently described. Uh, through Colson, the master of propaganda, through Young Americans for Freedom, Viva, right-wing media, uh, that's the open, overt propaganda campaign to cover up the attempt to get Jane Fonda, the attempt to shift the headlines, and so forth. That battle has partially already been lost by the White House, and that, of course, is what is fatal. Uh, uh, and that's why it's terribly important that the Irvin plan of a slow, steady development means everything, because in ratio to the amount of time that elapses now is how much can come out. The uh, covert on the White House, the burning and destruction of documents, of course, goes Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Dean, Gray, Peterson, and the Justice Department. That's the outright covert destruction of evidence. The buying off, the, the use of money, of bribery, and of threats runs down from Mitchell to uh, Magruder, Comback, Hunt, Dorothy Hunt, also a longtime CIA agent, Howard Hunt's wife, who's dead. Uh, evidence points to her being, having been murdered as she tried to get out of Operation Gemstone and was talking to the press, beginning to talk to the press. She's dead, and from there to the contract agents, who were some of them already in jail, some of them around the country, waiting to see whether they would be paid off. At this point, I'll save whatever else I have to say for uh, a question and answer period and uh, introduce uh, someone to you who's a really very extraordinary person. Um, he's, he's well known for his book, which was a really a classic of meticulous research, The Second Oswald, uh, uh, which was serialized in the New York Review of Books and published by Avon, and was, a, was the one book that dealt in a popular sense uh, for those who didn't understand ballistics and logistics and uh, scientific data of Dallas. The Second Oswald was uh, shocking and uh, unarguable. Uh, uh, proof of a conspiracy. Uh, but besides, he happens to be a very well-known philosopher and historian and uh, uh, formerly head of the philosophy department at uh, UCSD 
and uh, a very wide-ranging career indeed in politics and literature and history and philosophy, and uh, someone you're going to enjoy very much, I think, and who it's my pleasure to unleash now, <laughs> Professor Richard Popkin. <laughs> Thank you, and each time when talks about the Watergate, can't tell what the state of the argument is, unless you heard the car radio a minute ago. And so uh, I spoke up in Los Angeles two weeks ago, but I think things have moved so fast and so far that I'd like to deal with a different aspect of it first today, and I think we'll be dealing with another aspect a week or so from now. What seems to be the central issue, which is going to be the bombshell of next week, is what was referred to in the original introduction, this 1970 plan to get rid of all the opponents in the United States. The plan was stolen from the White House by Mr. Dean and placed in the safe deposit box. The keys were given to Judge Sirica, the White House First, apparently, didn't know what he had stolen. I'm not sure they know to this day all that he's stolen, since they seem to be mainly concerned about one document. And they gingerly start asking for their papers back. Good old Judge Sirica offered them their papers back after he Xeroxed them <laughs> <laughs> and gave a set to the Irwin Committee and Senator Symington's committee. It's through Symington that we're beginning to get some clues as to what this is all about. Senator Symington said on the 22nd of May, this is the most fantastic document I've ever read. He's given a couple of interviews to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and some to the New York Times and the Washington Post. In the meantime, as Nixon and his friends appreciated what had been taken, Nixon, we're told, in the latest issue of Time magazine, got all that remains of his staff, his few remaining friends, to work feverishly on this incredible 4,000-word document that was issued last week. And it's the first time in the history of the presidency of the United States that anything like this has happened. The president has been issuing a lawyer's brief, won't discuss it, but has to make sure it's on the record before things move too fast. And Nixon says, and if, I don't know if people had the patience to go through it, about one-third of, of the document is on the stolen paper of Mr. Dean. And Nixon says in his statement, the documents spelling out this 1970 plan are extremely sensitive. They include and are based upon assessments of certain foreign intelligence capabilities and procedures which, of course, must remain secret. And if one reads through Nixon's description of the importance of keeping this secret, the main point of his talk, or at least one of the major points, is to try and keep this a classified secret document. Since Nixon's talk, there have been analyses of it in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in Time, Newsweek, the London Observer, all based upon leaked information as to what's in this 1970 plan. And just today, this morning, we heard that Senator Irvin is just horrified having read for the first time what this 1970 plan is. Senator Weicker yesterday was giving a commencement address in Connecticut on it, and Weicker says about it, we've heard in recent days there's a slogan within elements of the Justice Department that the Constitution is not meant to be a suicide pact. <laughs> and the rewriting of it in the 1970 plan is to make sure it's not a suicide pact for certain people. But what's the plan? As far as we know, from a New York Times has published four articles on it, the Washington Post has had several, Time Magazine goes through a fairly careful putting together of it without ever quoting it. But the plan, as Nixon tells us, grew out of a catastrophic situation in 1970 when the FBI had stopped taking the White House seriously on what it was supposed to investigate. <laughs> 
And then New York Times has gotten a fair amount of background that Nixon, when he couldn't get the FBI to take it seriously, then tried to get the CIA. The CIA found that what was supposed to be investigated was to find out the foreign sources of the revenue of the students, the Black Panthers, and the Arabs in America. And for some reason, the Arabs in America figure very large in this, as we'll see in a moment. The CIA sent Nixon a 200-page analysis of what he was asking for, trying to teach him some elementary sociology, <laughs> that the country was in ferment because there are problems in the country, that racism happens to go on and some people don't like it, that the Vietnam War was going on and the students didn't like it, and hence they didn't need foreign support, foreign agitation, they had enough local problems to get them started. <laughs> with the FBI and the CIA refusing to cooperate, we're then told by Nixon that the matter was so serious that he called an emergency meeting of all the chiefs of intelligence of the two large agencies, the FBI and the CIA, the National Security Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, and some other small secret ones, <laughs> to sit around and figure out what to do. They drafted a plan. Hoover was the head of the committee. They drafted a plan which was sent to the president. Most of the work in the plan is by the man who's referred to in, in your introduction, Mr. Houston, in which they were going back, we're told, to procedures that had been carried on in this country from 1941 to 66. Procedures which Senator Symington called a license for unlimited burglary. Nixon called, with a new euphemism that will go down in history, a means of surreptitious entry. <laughs> <laughs> the plan apparently was to burglarize all the opponents and to burglarize embassies that might be giving them money. It's also a plan to intercept the mail, cut off communications, and whatever else was necessary. And I think we're going to find some rather amazing things because both Symington and Irwin have promised to print the plan next week. Well, we're told what they were doing was a series of activities that have been going on in this country by the FBI from 1941 to 66. That they were stopped in 1966, almost casually, by Ramsey Clark when he was asked by the FBI if they minded if, he burgl if they burglarized another embassy. <laughs> and he reports, he told them, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, <laughs> and wrote it all out for them, and Hoover kept his letter possibly kept it under his pillow, but had it with him in 1970 when Nixon wanted him to start this all over again, that Hoover wrote a series of objections to the order. And these objections include the news that he got from Ramsey Clark that it all happens to be illegal. <laughs> Time magazine indicates that the purloined paper of Mr. Dean is Hoover's copy. That's a copy with annotations by Hoover as to all the reasons he's giving for why he won't do it. It went to the president, or at least since nobody talks to the president, we have reason to believe it went to the president. The copy is marked the president's copy and not either Mr. Haldeman, Ehrlichman's, or Mitchell's, or anybody else, but the copy that's in existence is the president's copy. So we don't, it went to him. We don't know whether he read it. At any rate, uh, he issued the order in spite of all of Hoover's objections, and Hoover just apparently re refused to do anything about it. Five days later, the order was withdrawn, and the president says boldly it was never implemented. And since it was never implemented, we're then told in a background story in the New York Times that crisis broke out as to what the hell were they going to do if they couldn't carry on their business this way. Uh, and the crisis, as reported by President's present counsel, Mr. Garment, was they were convinced 
the Arabs in this country are about to do something awful. I can't. <laughs> and if one remembers the world, do you see another Xerox page? The world of summer of 1970, number of Arabs in America was not a very large number. <laughs> but in spite of this, as the garment reports, they were going to have meetings. Uh, here's the page. Uh, try and settle a Middle East question. Here we were, on the eve of Middle East talks, with information that the Arab commandos were going to start killing leaders in the Jewish community in America. What were we going to do? We were helpless. So what he says, what they did, is they asked the Israelis about it. And the suggestion in the interview is, not only asked the Israelis, the Israelis did it, burglarized whatever embassy had to be burglarized, and quieted down their nerves for a moment. But in quieting down their nerves, they then found a state of affairs in which the major intelligence agencies wouldn't accept the paranoid interpretation of the world that was emanating from the White House. And the White House wasn't going to give up its paranoid interpretation. <laughs> and so it's from this that various agencies we just discovered existing came into being. The Internal Evaluation Service, is it? Uh, 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 the Intelligence Evaluation Service and something else, which McCord stumbled upon and was getting memos from. And <laughs> Jack Anderson's been publishing their memos, which are extremely paranoid about the riot in San, Fran uh, San Diego which they're talking about half a million people coming to San Diego, they're buying thousands of guns, they're making armored tanks. This whole scheme and the paranoia that's involved in it actually begins with Nixon's arrival on the scene. The first thing Mitchell gets involved in as head of the Justice Department is a decision in the Supreme Court in 1969 about wiretapping. Supreme Court rules against Mitchell's side, and Mitchell, unlike any other secretary uh, of the Justice Department before him, interferes with the process of the Supreme Court. And we've learned he sent somebody around to try and get the Supreme Court to reconsider the case on the grounds that there was national security that they didn't realize. Supreme Court refused to consider it, so Mitchell made a decision that it was up to him to decide whether national security warranted wiretapping. And it took from 1969 to 1971 to get the court to decide that Mitchell can't write the laws himself. They have to be passed by somebody. And it doesn't happen to be a law which says that the Justice Department has the right to wiretap who it wants. So from 1969 to 71, we know he was doing it. And was doing it partly because of these leaks from the uh, government, but mainly, it appears, because of their panic about the blacks, the students, and the counterculture. And one element which I think is going to loom large in this, that one of the things that starts immediately along with Nick's, uh, Mitchell's desire to wiretap is the repression of the drug culture. And Operation Intercept, which is September 1969, is part of this overall scheme to suppress all the tendencies that Nixon and his friends couldn't stand. And I think we're going to find that some of what was going on in the background of Operation Gemstone is involved with the drug problem. A story appeared a couple of weeks ago in the Washington Post that within the first month that Nixon was in office, some leading pharmacologist was called to Washington and told by Eagle Crow, later one of the plumbers, that if he didn't agree with the White House on what to do about the drug problem, and the pharmacologists from Cornell had the view that one should treat it as a medical problem and investigate it medically, he was told if he didn't agree with the White House as a police problem, that the White House would destroy him, were Eagle Crow's words to him. And apparently they went ahead and tried to destroy the research of anybody who didn't agree with him. Well, it's all these efforts to get control of the opposition that they saw that after the FBI and the CIA wouldn't cooperate, then they start creating their own units. 
And then we're told that our president went out of his mind, got absolutely furious, didn't know what this man Ellsberg was likely to do. If he'd do something as terrible as give New York Times those papers, God knows what else he might do. And they, they immediately had to go find out what sort of a demon they were dealing with. And hence, dispatch of Hunt, Liddy, and the Cubans to Los Angeles to go get into the psychiatrist. Apparently, when the FBI asked the psychiatrist, was Ellsberg crazy and he wouldn't discuss the case, that wasn't enough. So they had to find out more. And Hunt's, uh, what's the term they use? They had to find out about his prosecutability. <laughs> <laughs> since they seem to have thought he really was crazy. Anybody who would do something in this order. And so as a result of Ellsberg, that we get the plumbers. That no agency other than the one in the White House is sufficient to deal with this. And from then on, the plumbers are going around burglarizing, and we're gradually finding out more and more burglaries. I think we're up to five. And it seems from the scheduling of these things that Hunt never took a day off, and any day he was in a city where there was a place worth burglarizing, they did it. And something I'm baffled about it, in terms of your charts, in terms of our uh, general view that Hunt must be the best spy this country had, that he always burglarizes with a crowbar. <laughs> that the job that was done in, in Los Angeles, that was done in the Watergate, that was done in the NAACP headquarters in New York that was done in the uh, green spun safe in Las Vegas are all done with crowbars and they just make a mess out of the place <laughs> and there's absolutely no effort to uh, hide the fact that the robbery has gone on and what's surprising is given the amount of robbery that occurs everybody except for the Democrats assumed it was normal robbery <laughs> and, and made nothing out of it and now suddenly everybody's realizing that their robbery was something more significant and we're beginning to get the pattern out of this. Well, with all this set up, then we start getting the actual Operation Gemstone. And I think the, Operation Gem uh, the actual Operation Gemstone stems from the 1970 campaign that Mr. Mitchell, who I think will find is much more the evil genius of the, all this, then he now appears, since the present stage of the argument, it's Mr. Dean leaking a lot of information as to what's wrong with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, and next stage, after we get done with the Dean 1970 paper, then I think we'll get back to what's wrong with Mr. Mitchell. And Mr. Mitchell was Nixon's campaign manager for 1970, in which the Republicans were going to gain control of Congress, they were gotten gain control of Congress by this law and order campaign of suppressing the counterculture. And you may remember the campaign came to a bad end in San Jose when Nixon appeared in a parade. <clears throat> a riot occurred, somebody, or a so-called riot, somebody threw a rock at him. It took the reporters about an hour to find out it was a paid rock thrower. <clears throat> and the San Jose riot failed to be this one that Don describes that was going to take place at San Diego, where they'd really have a riot. The last day of the campaign consisted of two speeches, Nixon raving in Phoenix on TV about this riot in San Jose, need for law and order, and so on. And then after him, Mr. Muskie sitting calmly by his seafront in Maine about how we should be reasonable, consider the problems of this country, and so on. And the contrast between this raving maniac <clears throat> and Muskie then made it appear to the voters, as the polls indicated, that Mr. Muskie was going to be the next president of the United States. At this point, we get what has now been labeled by Charles Taft, the son of Senator Taft, in his report of the Fair, Practices, uh, Fair Campaign Practices Committee that was issued last weekend, a conscious conspiracy to violate laws, to manipulate voters, and to make a mockery of the democratic system of self-government. Mr. Taft's committee has published a long report giving the details as to how they did it, in which structured first to make sure Muskie couldn't be a candidate, Senator Kennedy couldn't be a candidate, 
Muskie, we're beginning to see, was destroyed by these fake letters, by various people sent to break up Muskie meetings, to disarrange a schedule, to antagonize voters, and I think in a month or two we're going to find <clears throat> thousands of what Don calls contact agents here who were doing nasty little things which had the effect of getting rid of mu all of Muskie's strength. So it did appear sort of amazing that Muskie began 1972 as a sure winner in the Democratic ca uh, Convention and then couldn't carry the Polish ward in Milwaukee or Philadelphia. So the job was really thorough. Kennedy never got off the ground as a candidate, and the indication of why he didn't is that in Mr. Hunt's papers that were given to Mr. Gray to guard and later to burn, one is the fake cables about the late President Kennedy, the other is a file called Chappaquiddick. And nobody's asked Hunt yet, as far as I know, what was in the file about Chappaquiddick. They've asked him about the cable, and he's gone into lovely detail, which I'll mention some things about in a moment. Also, Mr. Caulfield, who you may have enjoyed last week, New York cop who looks like he's from a grade B night-night movie, <coughs> who works on divorce cases and blackmails people, and he calls up the White House from pay phones and things. <coughs> That's his story, that he got called up in the motel in San Clemente, was told to go out and put a dime in the booth and call up the White House. <laughs> the Western White House to get his instructions. Well, Caulfield also says he was working on Chappaquiddick, but nobody again asked him what is he working on. So we know of Caulfield and Hunt gathering enough crap about this to uh, scare Kennedy away from being a candidate. Muskie got sandbagged through Segretti's activities and other people's, and I recently I heard just yesterday that they've been able to find that both Hunt and Segretti were in San Diego back in February and March of 1972, arranging for people to disrupt Muskie's campaign if he ran the California primary. So the thing seems to have been organized fairly far in advance and got the job done. As the election season went on, it wasn't all roses for Nixon. The ITT scandal was blowing up. Jack Anderson was publishing very damaging documents. And the plumbers had to make sure that the Democratic Party was as weak as possible. It's in May the two remarkable events occur. One, that a leading candidate who would have made Nixon's election probably impossible, George Wallace, suddenly gets shot and can't run for public office anymore. If Wallace hadn't been shot, we'd still be counting the vote and still be trying to figure out who won the election. But he would have gotten a third of the vote, Nixon would have gotten around a third, and McGovern around a third. So just fortuitously, the one candidate who really mattered gets knocked off by, as usual, one lone nut, <laughs> and who gets very quickly tried, declared, insane, but not so insane they can't lock him up for life, and is cut off, and all information about him is cut off. The other amazing event is the burglarizing and the bugging of the Democratic headquarters. The explanation we've been given of this by the two participants who have appeared on TV, McCord and Barker, McCord explains how he has given all this news about the riot in San Diego, a menace building up to the Republican Party, and in his job as security officer for the Republican Party, what else could he do but try and find out whether it's all real? And McCord <coughs> was tantalizing the senators by telling them he's getting these daily reports from the Intelligence Evaluation Service, and nobody asked him what these things say. And fortunately, Jack Anderson is telling us what they say, and they're just absolutely screaming about the problems of this riot in San Diego. Barker, I think, is more a comedy relief to it, but Barker's testimony indicates that the team got sold on the view it must be relevant to national security. The national security somehow must be at what's at issue. Barker tells us what he 
the information is given about national security was the Cubans were financing McGovern. They send him 10 to 20 million dollars. So they break into the headquarters, and Barker admits that there is on the wrong office, so there's no such data, but since they're in, in an office, he might as well do something. So, <laughs> so he starts burglarizing. <laughs> and you may remember the marvelous scene when one of the senators asks Barker if he can really believe that the burglarizing in the Democratic headquarters has something to do with liberating Cuba. <laughs> and Barker says, sometimes I get confused about these matters. <laughs> <clears throat> but he's sure, he says, that if Mr. Hunt was for it, it must have something to do with national security. <laughs> of national security, which all this is uh, enveloped in from the time they get into office, is a real issue. If there really is something we're supposed to be worried about, if the country is coming apart or there are foreign menaces and so on, why can't it be explained? Why can't they actually state what the problem is and what has to be done to safeguard the country and find out if people want the country saved or not? <laughs> if they want it saved, <laughs> what price it'll take to save it? Instead of explaining it, this quotation I gave you from Weicker's speech yesterday, that people regard the, <clears throat> the Constitution as a suicide pact, if it really is a suicide pact in this day and age, and it's perfectly possible a document written in 1787 isn't really applicable in 1973, then some real effort should be made to consider what the state of affairs is, what laws we do need if we're really in danger, what constitutional changes ought to be made. Instead, nothing like this gets proposed. Instead, we're told the government was helpless. They had to do something to defend national security. So they do all these illegal things instead of trying to explain to the Congress, to the populace, that we're really in a bind and a fix and we need new laws. The couple of attempts to explain the problem were so preposterous they didn't convince anybody. The first attempt to explain the problem was in the case of the government of Mitchell against the New York Times. When the New York Times started printing the Pentagon Papers, if you remember, Mitchell rushed in the court to try and get the first injunction in American history against a prior publication. And in court after court, as the New York Times was stopped, and uh, the Boston Globe and the Washington Post and the uh, Los Angeles Times and other papers took on the job of printing the documents. In court after court, Mitchell tried to explain why it was necessary. And when they finally, in you know, a couple of days, got it up to the Supreme Court, a Supreme Court doctored by Mr. Nixon with lots of his friends on it, they still got a unanimous verdict against them. They couldn't convince anybody. In contrast to this state of affairs where they're arguing about national security and can't make reasonable conservative people believe it, we've just seen a case in England where two ministers had to be removed because of their sex lives that the Prime Minister of England immediately explained to Commons what the problem was. Everybody agrees, it's a, unfortunately, it's a problem. And they have to solve it right away. And they've appointed an independent commission that everybody trusts. And there's no uproar at all about the problem anymore. The cases we're now being offered, which are enveloped in last week's testimony of national security, revolve around the laundering of $100,000 of a Texas oil millionaire's money that was sent from Houston to Mexico City to Mr. Stans to Mr. Barker. And day after day we're being told that this is the point at which the CIA had to stop the FBI from investigating the Watergate. And yesterday's testimony of Mr. Ehrlichman I think really indicates how far gone this case is. Uh, the CIA, at a meeting with Ehrlichman, Gray, and so on, explains that there's, they have nothing whatever to do with the Watergate. They have nothing to do with this $100,000. They don't care who investigates the $100,000. It's not going to interfere with their business. So I guess it's either Ehrlichman or Haldeman who said yesterday, then they asked the CIA, is it possible that in the course of this investigation, 
that something relating to the CIA might turn up. Can you give us an absolute guarantee that if we investigate this, we won't turn up some CIA operation? I said, of course we can't give you such a guarantee. Get that problem just giving people a parking ticket. <laughs> they can't guarantee who's got, uh, uh, overparked, whether it's one of their agents or not. <laughs> so on that basis, the FBI is then called off the case because they might stumble on a CIA agent. <laughs> well, what does all this suggest? I think it clearly suggests the national security issue from Nixon 1969 to Nixon 1973 is bogus. But not just as bogus for the last four years, but I think we now have to consider maybe it's bogus for the last 25 years, ever since they started all this. But maybe last time I was talking, <coughs> discussing the possibility goes from Dallas to the Watergate, but maybe it goes from the pumpkin papers to the Watergate. Oh, wow. One may have noticed that during the debacle at the end of the Pentagon Papers case here, that some of the testimony of Hunt was given to the court in Los Angeles, some of his grand jury testimony. In that grand jury testimony, Hunt explained how he made the fake cable, uh, the fake cables that Kennedy is supposed to have sent ordering the assassination of Diem in 1963. And Hunt said that when he set to work on the cables, he couldn't find the typewriter on which the cables were originally written. But, he said, since the Alger Hiss case, nobody takes typewriter evidence seriously. So it didn't matter, and then proceeded without the real typewriter to make his forgeries. I noticed a couple of days ago, Nixon said that one reason he couldn't trust the CIA's answer, that the, they had nothing to do with the Watergate, is that you can't rely on your subordinates, that that's what Truman did in the Hiss case. So Nixon has the Hiss case on his mind all the time as to where this all starts. The Hiss case, there are plenty of indications as false data. And after his, Hiss's second trial, experts from the Fogg Museum in Boston went over the typewriter evidence, issued a report saying that the typewriter alleged to be Alger Hiss's typewriter is a handmade typewriter in which the fonts were soldered by hand. That it's a sort of typewriter you couldn't buy. That it isn't Mr. Hiss's typewriter. That the documents presented in the Hiss trial were not typed in the order that they're chronologically dated. And one expert said that the documents were not from 1938 but were from 1948. All this appears in the appendix in Alger Hiss's book on the case. At the time, the court refused to reopen the case on the basis of this evidence. I think after what Hunt said, we, and Hunt also casually remarks in the grand jury testimony when he was asked to fabricate the cables, there was no great difficulty for him because he'd been trained to do this, and he'd done it successfully many times. And I hope when he appears before the Irvin Committee, <coughs> somebody starts asking him about these many times. But if this sort of forgery has been going on by the government, how do we know it didn't start with the pumpkin papers? And the whole demolishment of a liberal State Department, the whole construction of the Cold War, isn't the outgrowth of this sort of thing. This is followed ra in rapid fire succession by the Rosenberg case, by McCarthyism, completely eliminating a whole liberal past that grown up under Franklin Roosevelt. Then in the 60s, we find a whole series of political assassinations which have changed the whole nature of our country. Each one of these assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and the attempted assassination of Wallace were immediately covered up Strangest documents are classified top secret, like Oswald's 1962 tax return, like the autopsy of Robert Kennedy. All this is being hidden, claimed to be classified, claimed to be classified in the interest of national security. Now that we know what national security amounts to under Nixon, 
And we've been told that the FBI was doing the sort of things Nixon wanted to reinstitute in 1970, was doing these from 1941 to 66. I think it's time to get extremely suspicious and to demand that we find out what's really been going on in this country and who's actually been running it. To come to the end of a story for the time being, what are we going to do with the present state of affairs? I think the present state of affairs, I was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, has reached crisis proportions. The Nixon's government is a shambles, is unable to function anymore, that he is crippled as a president and won't be trusted by his party or by Congress for the rest of his term. When the 1970 paper purloined by Dean is published in a week or so, it's going to show that he ordered the commission of felonies, the violation of laws, violation of the Constitution, the violation of his oath of office. What's going to follow then? Nixon, I think, gave his last defense in this crazy 4,000-word statement, and there's nothing left to do. The independent prosecutor, Mr. Cox, first day in the job, gets informed he's not an independent prosecutor. He's now supposed to take orders from Nixon. And Nixon can't even remember from day to day what the state of affairs is. Congress is faced with an extremely serious problem if the government can't function and they're going to have undoubted proof the president has committed crimes. Agnew at the moment is functioning as impeachment insurance. <laughs> he used to function as assassination insurance. <laughs> Because no one lone nut, there, at least the suspicion is there's no nut lone enough who prefers Agnew as president to the present state of affairs. <laughs> and now Congress, I think, is, feels somewhat stymied that if they impeach, the result is fairly obvious. And Nixon said to the at POW, said to his family, he's not going to quit. And nobody's taken up Congressman Rice's plan that Nixon and Agnew both quietly resign and we proceed from there. This being the state of affairs, I'm starting a suit to annul the election on the grounds of fraud, deceit, and so on. And I think the report by Charles Taft gives adequate grounds. And this is no joke. The suit is being discussed now in Massachusetts, New York, Missouri, Nevada, and California. And Judge Ruffin of San Diego is preparing a suit for me and others preparing it in other states. And I think that this is our best way out. We know the last election was a fake. We know we didn't have a genuine democratic election. And now is the time, instead of moving forward into the impeachment problem, moving backward to halt a genuine election and then start getting down to our problems again. The question is whether we have any faith that the, I assume you're talking about the Irwin Committee, whether the Irwin Committee is really going to unearth all this and the Speaker doesn't have much faith in the Democratic Party, thinks they're unlikely to really get to the bottom of it. Well, my guess is the bottom may be extremely deep and Mr. Dean said in an interview in Time Magazine last week, They've moved a couple of inches, but they have several miles to go. <laughs> and I think he knows whereof he speaks. <laughs> but I think one's also seeing a real crisis in the establishment that they never realized that the mafia, uh, uh, mafia politics had taken over. And that what they assumed was a sort of game that they play between the Democratic and Republican Party according to certain rules has been burst wide open by Nixon and his crew. And Nixon's crew has thrown, has made the Democratic Party the enemy and the Republican establishment unwanted. So if the Republican establishment can't talk to Nixon, there's an article in my San Diego paper yesterday that Bob Wilson, the head of the Congressional Committee of the Republicans, can't get a hold of Nixon on the phone. Hasn't been able to for months because Haldeman hates him. So I think the establishment wants to get rid of a feature of this. At the same time, they're so astounded by what's being used here that at least some members of it I've talked to in the last couple of weeks are prepared for the first time in a decade to consider that something outrageous has been going on for a hell of a long time and that 
if this sort of conspiracy can be run in the last couple of years out of the White House, that may be something like it's been run for the last decade. So I think people who would never have entertained the possibility that a conspiracy of the sort that appears in executive action could actually be taking place in this country now conceive it's a perfectly plausible set of events because the same damn things happened the last couple of years. So I think there will be pressure to get much further than they have in the past. Um, I'd just like to say a word to that. You know it's traditional in the American political scene that when there is extremism on the right, it is conservative forces which have dismantled it. Uh, that was true after the um, Palmer raids. It was true in the McCarthy period when as Joseph Welch, the acerbic Republican uh, from Boston, and the Watkins Committee uh, took apart uh, the McCarthy uh, power base and brought censorship uh, to the Congress. Uh, and as now it's Judge Sirica and the conservative constitutionalist uh, Senator Irvin. Now that's been the history uh, in this country that the swing away from right extremism has come from the center in this country and never from the left. And I think that uh, that's what we have to face now and when we look forward now perhaps to teach-ins on the campuses the way there were on the war and in churches and in labor unions and town hall meetings that there be, for the first time in American history, a radical critique and plan of action come forward out of this, uh, and that we not simply rest, as the gentleman suggests, uh, in the uh, b benign expectations of the Democratic Party to do the work for us. We have to not just be spectators at this television spectacular, but take a lucid and audacious series of actions of which an overflow meeting like tonight is a good example. The ties to Dallas at this point, I think, are basically structural. That is, organized crime, uh, a certain kind of industry, especially aerospace and conglomerate industry, and intelligence fronts. Those ties exist. The, this is the par uh, paradigm or the model uh, that we see here uh, for Dallas. As far as actual personnel that's tied between Gemstone and the executive action of Dallas in 1963, of course, that's very difficult, and it's going to take a, a, a lucky break, really, to break through. But let us say that one of those arrested in the Watergate, a man named Frank Sturgis, a professional assassin, was a friend, a co colleague, a co-worker of both Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry, who was Lee Harvey Oswald's New Orleans control or agent handler and who had been working with him since he had been a teenager, as a matter of fact. And Sturgis was questioned by the FBI immediately after the Dallas assassination. Um, he has, uh, uh, it was left ambiguous, as are most things in the Warren Report, uh, but he does seem to be a link, and he is involved in executive actions outside of the country. That much we know for sure. What evidence is there linking Sturgis? Uh, Sturgis was arrested the day after, uh, uh, he was interrogated the day after on November 23rd. Uh, there now are something like 60 pages of interviews with Sturgis from the FBI that are available which don't hang together with what, we, uh, what else we know. Sturgis apparently knew Oswald in 1962 in Miami. There's no evidence that Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who was killed in Dallas, ever was in Miami. So Sturgis may have known somebody else using that name, and in my book I offer evidence there's at least one other character, and I think by now we know of two other people who use that name. So Sturgis may have known somebody else using that name in some of these operations. Sturge, uh, Sturgis was involved in executive actions, was in partly in Barker's speech on behalf of Sturgis <laughs> the other day on the TV. What a great man he was. He started rattling off his past activities. <laughs> but I think when Sturgis testifies, we're going to find that he has been engaged in a lot of CIA activities trying to change the governments in Latin American countries. The question is, why are some of the witnesses now speaking? Uh, because they 
have immunity. Nothing more can happen to them. And they hope, in the case of McCourty, he hasn't been sentenced yet. He's hoping to influence his sentence. In the case of others, the sentence can be reduced. Now, uh, Hunt and Sturgis have enormous sentences at the moment, but they've been given immunity for any other crime they want to discuss. So I understand Hunt and Sturgis have been telling the grand jury tons of things of what, the, what else they did for a living, <laughs> and uh, they can't be uh, uh, pr uh, prosecuted for any other crime. Uh, and, uh, so I think it's the present pressure that a lot of these people are not interested in spending the rest of their life in jail. And I, I think besides that, we see here what's called, you know, clearly a contradiction in the ruling circle. The CIA is fighting for its life, as is the FBI. And it's clear that McCord and others that are going to go down the line to protect the CIA, and the only way they can protect the CIA is to implicate fatally the White House, so that if this were happening in another country where you saw the attempted takeover of intelligence agencies and then an open rebellion uh, between and among the intelligence agencies and the executive, you would realize that you were dealing with an aborted coup uh, and with a government enmeshed in the, um, in the hysteria and stranglehold of, of an aborted coup. You may be taken in by the political way in which this thing is developing, that if the Democrats start screaming, then they build up a opposition in the Republican Party that would hamstring it. And I think uh, I'm not pr privy to what the Democratic Party's councils are, but it appears to me that they are playing a very careful game of letting the conservative Democrats and the Republicans blow the thing wide open and not doing any pushing their own. They don't have to. But I think uh, another one of your points is very serious as to whether, as this unfolds and becomes obvious, the Democrats are a peripheral target uh, and that the real paranoia of the government was about the counterculture, whether the Democrats are going to care that much about the controls that were introduced for the counterculture and uh, going to let the thing peter out when it gets to that point. But I think the horror that they've all, uh, everybody has read the Perloin document as expressed, indicates that does go beyond anything they'd ever conceive of doing. I, I think this, the, these p points are well taken, and, and, and it is a, a, a fight within a fight. That is to say, the Rockefeller agent Haig is in the White House now, the moderate wing of the Republican Party, uh, while the right wing of the Republican Party is moving swiftly to take over the funding and the state and city uh, machinery of the GOP machine. So there's a terrific fight going on. I would guess that we could say power has already changed hands in my opinion, the fact that the independent prosecutor could only be a Kennedy man is a clear indication to me that the Kennedy elements of the establishment, of the ruling circle, are definitely coming into power uh, at that level. That isn't to say the popular level, but at the level of the machinery of government and the backing of the, those elements in the establishment which can be considered uh, progressive as opposed to the more reactionary elements that lie behind Operation Gemstone. I do think that in the teach-ins that I contemplate coming up that it's uh, time for a revision and a demystification of the Cold War in the 50s as never before and that the Hiss case and the Rosenberg case have to be shown now. We can now point, we've been able to point all along to forgeries and subornation and every other kind of blackmail used in those cases. Now we have a different kind of context, a different kind of spotlight, and we owe it to the 1950s and what was... They perpetrated war on the progressive movements in this country. They used the techniques of war while we used the techniques of the First Amendment. We used leaflets, we used the right to free speech, the right to demonstrate peacefully, we used the electoral process, we used political process to try to make change. It's clear now that we suffered and, and underwent a series of warlike actions against us. That explains our defeats in the 50s. It explains what happened to the black liberation movement in the 60s. They were the victims of warlike acts. That explains our defeats, not some subjective and psychological and hypercritical uh, uh, technique that we've developed to blame each other for our defeats.
We suffered at the hands of a paramilitary orchestrated operation that's been in high gear for some 25 years. Having seen that, we have to come back now with the political techniques that we have developed in these periods and do what we did for Watergate, what we did in the war. We were able to create in the anti-war movement so much contradiction that Operation Watergate became inevitable for the ruling circle. And that's our next challenge in the 70s now. I think one of the great opportunities we're going to have, whether we do it or whether the establishment does it, is for the first time we're going to find out how they carried on this paramilitary war that uh, people are now coming up from the underground, the FBI, the S Secret Service, and so on, uh, and the CIA, who are willing to explain how certain events occurred. And for the first time, we'll get the data and then be able to construct a real history of what went on. The question was whether, <clears throat> in view of uh, what's come out about the difficulties the present administration had with J. Edgar Hoover, in the opportune time of his death, well, there's any reason to suspect, I don't know whether you're suggesting foul play. Uh, I, I just don't know of any reason. He was an elderly gentleman, not in good health. So, uh, what was he, 76? Uh, so uh, I don't find it extraordinary. But it is, the month of May 1972 does turn out to have been a, a very extraordinary month. Hoover died at the beginning of it. <coughs> Bremer has shot Wallace in the middle of it, and the Watergate occurred. And isn't it also the month of one of the great busts in Washington, D.C.? The Roundup. <laughs> Keep an eye on the public, they'll never object or tell us Snoop's working, but they will minutes, but not before we get a couple of more subscriptions at 84867. Well, photo the proof of two guns firing at the Ambassador Hotel in 1968. But this question I try to take up in detail in the novel of fact, Executive Action. One of the reasons the left did not respond to a crisis in 1963, certainly the equivalent of Watergate in 1973, was that the scenario, the cover-up scenario, worked. But the question is well taken, and in these teachings, I think the left should examine why it is that it accepted these crucial assassinations, uh, this accepted the story put out by the government propaganda and did not address itself to these issues which affected the man in the street and the woman in the street in the 60s in the way that the war affected the radicals. I'll take this occasion now to uh, make a revelation for the first time in public concerning the uh, uh, Kennedy assassination. And that is that both Professor Popkin and I on separate occasions, well, I'll speak only for myself, have now had confirmed that Mr. Clay Shaw was not a contract agent but an employee of the Central Intelligence Agency and that comes from the highest ranking Central Intelligence Agency officer ever to quit, Victor Marchetti. The super conspirator Charles Colson is the go-between between the Teamsters and the White House. He's also he's the Teamsters lawyer right Yeah, now. he's also the Teamsters lawyer. He took that account with him when he left the White House early after having made uh, uh, covered his tracks as he thought perfectly to set up Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Mitchell and Dean and not get caught himself. And it's dubious to me whether Colson, who to me is the arch conspirator, ever will be caught. And the reason I call Colson a double agent is that Colson does not come to the White House from the USC old boy gang or from UCLA or from from the West Coast. Colson comes from being the chief aide to Carl McIntyre, the man in charge for orchestrating the pro-war marches, and the link between McIntyre and the American mission in Saigon and Marshall Key. And when he left the right, and these are the extreme elements of the right, the American Security Council, these are the elements involved, uh, the action elements in these assassinations. When he went to the White House, the euphemism was used that he was to be liaison 
for the committee to re-elect, that is, to ethnic groups, the American Legion, and so forth. What he was liaison to was the extreme right, those same men from the American Security Council and the National Rifle Association, etc., who alone met with Nixon on the eve of the invasion of Cambodia. Let me add, the Teamsters are a special problem. They've been involved with Nixon for a long time. They paid for his house in Palos Verdes estate. And uh, I'm sorry Peter Scott isn't here tonight because he's an expert on all the dealing with him. A big suit is now going on between Chotner and the man from New Hampshire leader, Loeb, over Chotner's role in collecting two and a half million dollars or three million dollars to get Hoffa out of jail and the Teamsters' contribution to the re-election fund. So I think the Teamsters are a special element in their relations with Nixon. But uh, 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 with regard to Colson, besides what Don says, I had noticed that Colson's the one who brought Hunt into the whole operation and been looking for how he happened to know Hunt, that Hunt does, isn't the sort of man you meet casually. <laughs> He's always off on a job. Turns out Colson went to college with Hunt in Brown in 1942, and they've been friends ever since. Hunt is also the extreme right. And when I met somebody who had been with Hunt the day Nixon went to China, and Hunt was raving, we shouldn't send people to China, we should send bombs to China. And here is Nixon's best agent, best burglar, and he doesn't even support the China policy. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, both Hol Colson and Hunt were two of the original organizers of Young Americans for Freedom, a definite intelligence front, and that Young Americans for Freedom will start to figure prominently now, I think, I as we go further into Operation Gemstone, along with Viva. Uh, uh, the only other person who surfaced as a friend of Hunt's is William Buckley, and Buckley is, <coughs> is the godfather of Hunt's four children and the executor of Mrs. Hunt's estate. <laughs> In the novel, Executive Action, exists what I consider the proof that Kennedy, after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, came to the decision that capital and the establishment could only be saved by the dismantling of CIA clandestine, which had gotten out of control, the Cuban desk and elements in the CIA were out of control, and that he must liquidate the involvement in Vietnam. Now, you can argue, as some do, and there's two arguments. One, that it was a steady, smooth escalation from Eisenhower through Nixon, or that Kennedy was making a change, and that was one of the reasons he was assassinated. I think there's proof for the second for this reason. When the headlines in 1963, October, uh, the uh, blazoned, Troops Home by Christmas, Advisors home by 65, and he put those words in the mouth of McNamara and Taylor. You can argue, well, he was just lying, like uh, Johnson and Nixon, but there's one flaw in that argument. One thing that nobody ever did, except Kennedy, was set a date. To set a date was to take away the option uh, for a political realist, like the Kennedy brothers, uh, of, of going back on that option. In, in other words, he made this over a year before the election. He was bringing a thousand troops a month home. He was down to 12,000. And Dick Popkin and I sat in the Pentagon Papers trial and our mouth fell open when we heard, read from the Pentagon Papers, that the National Security Council minutes of August, September, and October 1963 no, November. and November are missing, and the historian of the Pentagon Papers in a footnote says, therefore, we have to rely on, on, on books that were published about the period, and it was precisely that gap or lacunae of August, September, October, November, 63, when the decision was taken to liquidate Vietnam, when we only have the quote from Bobby Kennedy, we have to go all the way or get out, the same thing he used on the Hawks in the, in the Bay of Pigs crisis, and we know was a technique of the Kennedy brothers to force the hand of the Hawks, to tell them to go all the way or get out. That's all we have left over from that four-month period. It was into that gap that Charles... Colson had Howard Hunt forge the cables because that gap existed, that those cables had been missing since, since just after the assassination. And it's into that gap that the forge cables to tie JFK to the DM assassination went. So I think that we have proof now that Kennedy, for reasons having nothing to do with pity for the Indo-Chinese people or a change of heart, 
decided, just as Nixon decided many years later to go to China to do many things, the salt talks, disarmament, many things that Kennedy was planning, it's simply that Kennedy, almost a generation earlier, had taken the decision that he would build a new kind of coalition of labor, minorities, young people, and institute a kind of American quasi-social democracy and set up a reign which would lead from John Kennedy to Robert Kennedy to Edward Kennedy, stretching to 1984, a 24-year reign of power and an enormous restructuring of America. So that I'm not minimizing the power uh, potential of the Kennedy brothers. What I'm saying is that I believe all evidence points that when those headlines came out, troops home by Christmas, advisors out by 65, that it was true. Uh, let me add a couple of facts I know on this. Uh, in the Washington Post of last Saturday, they print a story about the real secret intelligence organization that runs everything, uh, which keeps changing its name any time anybody finds out what its name is. <laughs> and, it, and it keeps no records, but they decide what sort of uh, uh, executive actions will take place and so on. And the story says that Bobby Kennedy was never allowed to be a member of this group. He wanted very much to be, but Mitchell did become a member, and it got politicized as soon as Mitchell got involved. Kennedy was trying to get in charge of this sort of thing and was failing. All through 1963, he'd been setting up committees to find out what was really going on and who was running the intelligence organizations. And every time these committees would turn out to have either Alan Dulles on it or McCone or somebody else in the CIA, and Kennedy would be no further along than he was before. The last committee he appointed was in the early 19, November 1973, and Alan Dulles was on it and came to no useful conclusion by the time of his death. But I was told by Senator Morse that Morse in a conversation with Bobby Kennedy right after the assassination, was assured that his brother had taken the decision to get out of Vietnam and was going to meet with Senator Lodge, who was then our consul in, uh, in Saigon, two days later in San Francisco. So there seems to be a basis for the claim that it was really going to happen. As far as the Bay of Pigs goes, I don't know when it got started, but it's obviously well underway before Kennedy got to be president. Both Nixon and Nixon said he knew all about it during the debates that were going on and didn't dare reveal it. These are the best. When we say they're the best, Hunt was in charge of plans. The legendary Eduardo for Playa Giron, for Giron, for the Bay of Pigs. And McCord was a super agent. Dulles dropped him behind the lines in the Soviet Union in the 1950s on the most delicate operations. But what must be pointed out, and I go to some pains to do it in the novel, they made even more egregious errors in the Dallas assassination of 1963. But the media and the electorate and the left were were paralyzed and did not seize upon these errors. And when you say they are just bunglers, they are the best that American technology and finance can put forward. And to give proof of that, until the day of their arrest, Hunt and McCord both sat on special emergency crisis committees. McCord was the head of a 16-man unit working out of the Pentagon in charge of the censorship of news and the roundup of subversives, and that's a quote, in time of emergency. And Hunt, in the 50s and 60s, had sat on two emergency planning boards in charge of censorship of news and roundup of subversives in time of emergency. These are the men who would act out, if necessary, the scenario after the agent provocateur did their work in San Diego or Miami had Operation Gemstone not been aborted. But this is the best they can do, and they were equally clumsy in the Hiss case and in the Rosenberg case. A fool or a child can see what went on in the Rosenberg case. It's fear and not lack of their mistakes or our intelligence that have paralyzed us. And I think we have to say that just as they failed abominably in Vietnam, Vietnam with their plans, failed in Cuba, have failed all over the world and will fail all over the world because their worldview is based on an inferior race, an inferior class, starting with the American populace. That is doomed to failure and that is why they have to resort everywhere and always to violence as soon as their crackpot scenarios break down. And that's why we have to push them to the wall now. They are moral morons and operationally they are often fools and clowns, but what they have behind them is the organized violence of the state, and that we mustn't underestimate, but we mustn't over
overestimate the mystique of these clandestine crackpots. <laughs> I don't know whether it's arrogance or whether, as some people are suggesting, that maybe they were set up to fail and they were setting themselves up to fail as part of their CIA war against the, uh, against the Nixon administration because the whole thing, uh, the actual Watergate seems a, a really incredible burglary and New York, Los Angeles and all sorts of places are full of much better burglars than that. <laughs> There is a new book out in France identifying two, to identifying two of the Watergate men as having approached the OAS, that is the right-wing insurgents against de Gaulle, to uh, kill Kennedy when he visited de Gaulle in 1962 using as a cover an attempted assassination on de Gaulle. And we don't have enough facts on that yet, but two of the uh, Watergate have been, I think we can guess definitely who one of them is, but uh, have been identified in France by an OAS agent. I, I found, uh, I was in Washington in the uh, earlier part of May, that there's a tremendous struggle going on within the old agency, the CIA, between its original faction uh, that set it up, between the young Turks who've been trying to get out the people they regard as dinosaurs like Hunt and McCord, and the politicized people who Nixon has brought in. Uh, uh, the man who's been appointed the new head of the CIA, hasn't been approved by Congress yet, was head of their political assassination division, Mr. Colby. And Mr. Colby has said in t testimony before Congress he's responsible for Operation Phoenix, that he killed 6,000 political people in Vietnam by assassination, not by B-52s. So that's the sort of person who is the old CIA and Colby, in an interview with the New York Times, said that he regards the CIA as the most important bulwark of democracy, it's more important than the political government, and so on. I talked to McCord when I was in Washington, and I think McCord holds similar views. And these represent the original CIA position. But then there are people who have come up since the original group who regard themselves more as technicians, and see Hunt, McCord, Colby, and so on as Neanderthals from the original Cold War. And then Nixon's been adding into this politicized people who see the CIA as functioning as an arm of the political process of the ruling government. So I think at the moment there's a three-cornered fight going on as to who's going to control the CIA and also what role it's going to play in the future. And Hunt uh, McCord's been issuing endless memoranda. You gather from the, the hearings, he writes them six times a day. And one day, as in Washington, he issued a 383-page memorandum. And each one of these things always ends with a plea for restoring the original CIA. So I think they're, uh, the, uh, the old boys are trying to get back to where they were in uh, 1950 or so, and with the sort of influence they have. The question is asked is, who are Sirhan Sirhan and James Earl Ray and how they fit into this pattern of conspiracy? Ray, I think, is a very interesting case where the evidence that he was guilty is so minimal, the evidence he's involved in conspiratorial activity maximal, and nobody, uh, the establishment immediately decided he's a lone nut, he's a racist, and that's why he did it. They couldn't find anybody who ever discussed racism with him. That he had lived in Los Angeles in a hotel somewhere around here, and nobody in the hotel ever heard him uh, having the slightest interest in politics, race, or anything else. He uh, apparently is a hired gun, a hired hoodlum, who was smuggling from the time he escaped from jail to the time he was arrested after King's death. And smuggling is not an activity you can carry on by yourself. So we have to smuggle in concert. It's not one of these victimless crimes. <laughs> it has to be a conspiracy. If Mr. Fensterwald, who is McCord's lawyer, is also James Earl Ray's lawyer, and he's taken on the case after everybody else milked Ray of all the money he had, and he apparently had a hell of a lot in the beginning, far more than he could ever have gained by any of the activities 
uh, the FBI claimed he, he was engaged in. The FBI said he earned his money bank robbing, but they could never name a bank he robbed. <laughs> uh, so a Ray seems to have been somebody who was hired by a conspiratorial apparatus, which, uh, from the fact he's engaged in smuggling, I guess it's connected with the mafia, and was sent from place to place to do various things. And Ray's own claim is he didn't do the shooting. He was just sent to register in a motel there, register in this rooming house, deliver a gun. Then, for the first time, since he never read anything but the sports section, he discovered when the gun went off that Martin Luther King was there and beat the hell out of the town and then spent a, a fortune traveling around until he was caught. So uh, I think Ray is part of a conspiratorial apparatus, and how it's connected with the others, I don't think we know yet. Sirhan's more mysterious, maybe Mr. Kimbrough knows more about this, but there's certainly plenty of evidence that Sirhan did not act alone. The three people went with him to buy the bullets. There was the lady in the polka dot dress. There's some evidence that he was in San Diego with a man the day before getting ready for the event. So uh, I think he's hardly a loner. Fence DeWald has found when he tried to get information from the State Department as to whether Sirhan ever had a passport, they clam up entirely, regarded as one of the greatest state secrets of all time, <laughs> and Fence DeWald used to be a lawyer for the State Department, has been able to find out about anybody else he is interested in, if they ever had a passport, but this is the one case where he's been absolutely stymied. So I think there is some indication that Sirhan's also part of some sort of conspiratorial apparatus. I have with me a motion that Fence DeWald's made in the United District Court, United States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee, a memorandum of facts about the Ray case, which would convince any reasonable man they didn't solve the case. He's unable to get any evidentiary hearing, just gets turned down these things. So I'm going to try and publish this as an article, so at least if the courts don't want to hear it, people will know that the case, there really is no case against Mr. Ray. Great. Thank <laughs> you.